Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie. And today I am so honored to have on the show, Mr. Tom Sosnoff. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Trey. Great to be here. I'm really excited to have you because I've been a longtime fan. In fact, you were largely responsible for me getting interested in investing early on. Um, and I went down the rabbit hole quite a bit on the whole advanced option strategies. I've had my own journey and some of that might come to light today. And I'm really eager to talk to you and discuss a few, uh, a few strategies, um, some of which might not be known to a lot of our investor base. And, uh, and I'm really excited to dig in all, all that dig in on all of that. But before we do that, I wanted to just briefly touch on the fact that you are a breathtaking entrepreneur. I mean, your, your own journey besides trading has been incredible. First with the Thinkorswim platform, now with this billion dollar acquisition of Tasty Trade. So since we study billionaires on the show and you sold this company for a billion dollars, I have to ask you this question, which is what'd you do to celebrate? Um, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Ab absolutely nothing. Um, damn, celebrate. Uh, I, I, I don't think I, I we have a, like a no high fives rule. So I um, honestly, I, I don't think I, I don't even think I, so I don't think I did anything. You know, I respect that answer. And it's funny because I feel like while you're going through the entrepreneurial journey, sometimes you build up those big moments in your mind. But then once they happen, you're just sort of like, yeah. All right, this is business as usual time to carry oh, on. <laughs> it's a hundred percent business as usual. I don't even, the crazy thing is I, I don't even think about it. Like it doesn't even, it's not even part of, you know, it, like it doesn't, like none of it even phases me or, or it, it doesn't even ring a bell. Like nothing. It's just like, okay, let's, let's go. Let's move on. What's next. Now, yeah. have you always been like that? I'm curious because, you know, having maybe a little bit of time to reflect on some of your successes, do you, have you found a chance or have you had a chance to sort of distill down maybe a few of the core tenets that have, that you feel have, has really led you to the success you've had? Um, you know, <laughs> it, it's kind of, um, you, you feel a little uncomfortable talking about yourself in sometimes in those ways. Cause it's like, Cause you, in hindsight, you want to say, oh man, I was really good at this or that, but, but the reality of it, when it's happening is you're kind of shooting from the hip and you're not even sure kind of what you're good at or what you're, you know, really bad at. I, I mean, I like to say the thing that, that we do recognize that we are really good at is just taking risk, like just doing, you know, it's, there's a strong belief in, in what we're doing and taking the risk to pull it off is kind of, it's really hard, you know, like, like you can't worry about, like, I don't worry about losing. So that's kind of it, you know, a sort of leap in the net will appear sort of mindset. Um, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, like you're not even worried that if there's a net there, like that's the thing, like, I don't, you know, I mean, I guess at some point, different points in my career, I probably was worried, but I'm, I don't worry about that anymore. Like it's not part of the equation. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, well, interesting. I, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I wonder if the Tasty Trade success has anything to do, uh, I'm sure it has a lot to do with the fact that the brand was very authentic. I mean, this is you know oh, yeah. one of your second or third successes. So I feel like it was almost a passion project perhaps for you. And therefore like the tone and the brand was very just authentic. It wasn't too polished. It was a little bit quirky uh, or it is, you know, still to this day, it's running obviously still, but what the, the, the days I started watching it, it had some funny music and funny programming and just maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Well, we haven't changed that, you know, like, like we, we kind of had an idea of, you know, what we wanted to do. We weren't really sure what we were doing, but we kind of had an idea of what we thought financial content should look and sound like. And we knew it wasn't what was currently out there. Like I knew, you know, we were not building another CNBC or another Bloomberg, or we weren't, we, 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 we wanted there to be a connection between the personalities and between you know, the snarkiness and the sarcasm and the, um, you know, because, because when you think about the, the trading business, it's, it's, 
it's a combination of like a certain amount of smarts and a certain amount of locker room antics. You know, it's, 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 it's a little bit of everything. And, and I'm not saying that every business to a certain extent isn't, but, but we just felt like, you know, we wanted to create a big playground that engaged people. And I think that's ultimately what we did. And the only way we know how to create a playground is like through, you know, kind of um, being silly and having some fun with it. Was it kind of a scratch your own itch sort of approach there with the uh, ethos of the company or just kind of I mean, bring your own personality to, a to extent, it? To a certain extent, every startup is. But I think that, you know, we were very confident in our, in our core, you know, in our know-how, specifically in our know-how of the space we were in. So we, we were confident in, in ultimately the foundation of what we were building. We just weren't sure exactly how it was all going to work, but we didn't know how Thinkorswim was going to work either when we first started, you know, like, like these are, these are very typical growing pains for any, any small startup, any new startup. And, um, you know, I mean, the only thing I would say differently is that when we built Tasty, uh, our expectations were different. Like when we built Thinkorswim, you know, 20 some odd years ago, our expectation, we, we, we were smaller time crooks as I like to say, to steal the Woody Allen movie thing. You know, we were small time crooks back in, you know, meaning that we didn't really know how to think that big. And the first time we had a hundred million dollar valuation, we thought it was just like, wow, you know, look what we did. Like, you know, this is unbelievable, you know? And this time, you know, when we got to a billion, we're like, eh, you know, like, like, okay, that's cool. But let's, you know, you know, like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was just, we didn't even, the numbers, the numbers didn't matter anymore. You know, it was almost like when we were floor traders, you know, the first time you made a thousand dollars, you're like, wow, that's incredible. Like I, I killed it. And the first time you make 10,000 or a hundred thousand or a million, you're like, wow, this is amazing. And then later on, you're like, eh, who cares? You know, like, it's like, it's just, let's, let's just move on. Like, what's the next thing? Like, you, you know, you start, you get this, um, um, you know, you just have this thirst for, you know, for, for validation, for, you know, for being successful, the, the money. I know like so many people say the money doesn't mean anything. I'm telling you the truth. The money doesn't mean anything. It's really, it really was never part of the equation. We just wanted to validate that, hey, you know what? We wanted our legacy to be, hey, we're a couple of good, we're really good entrepreneurs and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Something you said a long time ago that I heard you say stuck with me and it was something to the effect of, you know, you had sold Think or Swim and, and that was a huge success. And you, were, you said something to the effect of, yeah, a lot of people think you just retire off to a beach somewhere, but like that only works for like a week and then you get bored. And it's like, you know, so with Tasty Trade, it seems, were, was this a endeavor that was, that was kind of built to sell or was the sale somewhat of a surprise, you know, getting to that echelon? Was that something that you had intended from um, day one? When, when we built Thinkorswim, we, 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 were, we were 10 years old when, I mean, we had, we had people that were inquiring about the firm because it was a really good firm for, for a couple of times throughout the years, but we really didn't get serious offers until we were 10 years old. And at 10 years old, we had three, we were a public company. We had three cash offers for the business. And so we had to take those to our board. And since we lost control of the board through dilution and other things like that, we, we basically had to pick one of the three and we picked TD Ameritrade for a couple of different reasons. But um, uh, with Tasty, um, we never had a single person. We were, an out, we were outcasts. I mean, not one person in 10 years. We started in 2011. Um, it wasn't until the end of 2020 when we got our first group that was interested in us. And, um, and not, we hadn't heard from a single person for 10 years before that. We were like, does anybody know how cool this business is? And we, we were not shopping it. We didn't, you know, we have this kind of like 10 years. It's the old Theo Epstein used to say, like, I can spend 10 years with one team and then I got to kind of, you know, I got, I, I got to shake it up a little bit. I kind of feel there's a little bit of truth to that after 10 years, you know, especially where I am in my life, I need to shake things up a little bit. And, you know, and, and um, so 10 years into this, and then at the end of right around when the pandemic started and, you know, through the end of 20. 20 through the beginning of 2021 um we had five cash offers for tasty trade and five offers solid like real companies with real money and the whole deal and they were all 
with some were higher than we took. Um, we just decided that this was the best trade for us and we were ready to do something a little bit different. So we, we went that direction. Um, you know, I mean, we're still busting our ass and doing stuff and, you know, same, it's, it's same stuff, new playground, you know, just like having some fun, you know, doing stuff. And it's, trading along the way, because, you know, true to form starting this interview, you were trading right up to the start of the conversation. So it doesn't seem like anything's really changed. You know, you've moved on, but you're, the trades are still active and still no, that no, passion no, I, is still I, there. I still love trading. I mean, I, this week I've averaged over a hundred trades a day. You know, I did just under a hundred trades today. I did like 120 trades yesterday. I did a hundred trades on, on, uh, whatever it was Tuesday. Um, no, I trade all day long. I'm, I'm a junkie, man. I, I don't, you know, I love running the business and I love doing the show and, and I love building technology, but you know, I mean, this is my life. I don't really have any, you know, I don't have any hobbies. So like some people have hobbies, you know, they paint or they travel, you know, I don't do anything. I just, you know, trade and work. Um, I'm okay with that too, by the way. I don't feel like I'm, you know, I don't feel like I need something else necessarily. I'm, I'm okay with it. Like, you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm good in my skin, you know? I love it. Well, I want to talk about some of those. I mean, first of all, hundred trades in a day sounds probably crazy to a lot of our listeners. So I want to definitely dig in on what exactly is going on there, but we rarely cover options on this show. And, you know, I'm tempted to delve into somewhat of an options one-on-one discussion, but I know that we've already had that conversation elsewhere. In fact, we, we had you on our millennial investing shows episode 79. So if you're looking for that kind of thing, I definitely encourage folks to go listen okay. to that and uh, get a little bit of, uh, if they get a little lost in the weeds here. But I'd like to address the fact that a lot of folks first learn about buying calls and puts, but talk to us a little bit about why it might be more advantageous to instead sell options. Um, well, it, it's theoretically, it's not necessarily more advantageous to sell options than it is to buy options because theoretically the markets are tight, they're priced efficiently. It's, there's no theoretical edge. Um, we like to say, we like to think that there's some kind of like a mechanical edge, which essentially just means that uh, I like to make force the market to beat me rather than I'm gonna to try to beat the market. So, so I think it's easier to sit back and let the market try to, you know, outsmart you than it is for me to try to outsmart the market. It, this is a very simple game. There's, there's only two sides. So there, there's, there's only two players, you know, and, and so it's not this, it's not this massively complex game where there's a hundred different choices or something like that. There's only two sides and um, uh, there's lots of strategies, but there's only two sides. And so, so my preference is, and, and I've been doing this a really long time. And my preference is I want to do things that have a very high probability of profit or a very high probability of success, I should say. And in order to get a high probability of success, you have to have, you have, to have unlimited losses and limited profitability. That's the simple model. And that's very hard for people to understand because options are different. Options are strategic whereas stocks and futures and things like that and digital assets are all, they're all black and white. So they're, they're static as we say, but options give you an opportunity um, to do something that's a little bit different. You can take, you can put, you can use a strategy with limited profitability and unlimited risk, which will essentially give you a higher chance of being successful than anything else. That's, that's just how, that's just a math model. And then, I actually like that because I like to be right. Doesn't mean you make money, it just means you like to be right. And so I, I feel like if you combine lots of wins, it's easier to be successful in the long run than, than trying to hit a home run every now and then and you know, leaving a lot of men stranded type thing. So anyway, that's, that's my approach. So I prefer the sell side and the short premium side and it, it tends to work for me. So one of, you know, so talking about the selling side, one of the strategies uh, that's often talked about is the selling of naked puts. And this is a, a very popular approach. Walk us through the appeal of why you would sell something like a naked put. Um, you know, it has the highest 
statistical chance of success of any strategy. The markets have what they call positive drift embedded in them. That just means that markets go, um, markets have a small drift to the upside because it's the, it's the, it's how you get paid over risk-free rates. So if you think, hey, I can put my money in in XYZ at risk-free and I can earn, let's say, a few basis points right now. Um, well, if you're going to invest in the stock market, you're going to take risk. You deserve to make more than a few basis points because you're taking risk. So we call that kind of positive drift. So the, the concept of selling puts is um, you sell something that is expensive, that has a very high probability of success. And even though it has limited profitability, it generally works over time, generally. And that's the whole thing behind selling puts. I mean, the, the, it's some people like to say puts or schmutz. Other people like to say, hey, you know what? It is the most successful strategy over a long period of time because the market has positive drift and stocks like to go higher. That's all there is to it. Interesting. So what are the key advantages in your opinion of doing something like that instead of just buying the stock if you're bullish on it? Higher probability of profit. So if you buy a stock and you're bullish on it, it's basically a 50-50 shot. If you sell an out of the money put, you have limited profitability, but you probably have an 80% chance of being right. So people like the 80% chance of being right more than they like the unlimited profitability. I mean, there are people that like unlimited profitability. I'm just one of those people that like the 80% chance of being right. You're capping your profits to get a higher pr probability of success. Yeah, you're step. giving up your unlimited profitability in return for a much higher probability of profit. That's all it is. Interesting. Well, with that positive drift, sometimes comes low volatility. And as I understand it, option pricing, I mean, options are have more what's the best meat on the bone, should we say, if there's more volatility. So one crucial concept to understand with options is the is that the pricing revolves around this thing called implied volatility. So is that simply a metric for risk or is it something more? It's a metric. It 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 is a fear metric, but essentially implied volatility is another word for expected move. And yes, in a perfect world, if you got to choose the perfect time, you would sell implied volatility um, when it's high. <laughs> I mean, as opposed to when it's low. And so usually you get high vo implied volatility in down moves. So if the market is going down or it's pulling back or whatever you want to say, and volatility is expanding, you usually have the perfect scenario for selling puts, which is low basis, high implied volatility. Low basis just meaning low price. So low price, high implied volatility, sure, it's the perfect world. So I want to kind of talk about the idea of layering these strategies on top of buy and hold type sure. portfolios. So, because sure. I think this is where things get really interesting and um, it might be a little bit difficult to grasp some of these concepts upon first listen, but talk to us about the advantages of layering strategies. And I'd like to start with what you would call a vertical. So talk to us about that and why you might include something like that in the portfolio. Well, first of all, you, it's totally fine. You know, in, in, in 2021 now, the, the, the online trading technology is so good and the excess the product accessibility is amazing. So you can basically trade anything from a single platform. It doesn't matter what it is. And so there's no excuse for not, you know, kind of learning what you can do and layering, um, anything on top of any kind of static investment. Uh, if, you're, if you're improving your basis or giving yourself a chance to improve your basis, I mean, why wouldn't everybody do that? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Why not? So, so I love the idea of, in fact, I don't know why anybody that has a static investment, unless you're not allowed to trade something against it, wouldn't trade something against it. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like if you had a chance to sell a call on anything that you own, that was a liquid marketplace, you do it. I mean, what do you care if it gets called away? I mean, unless it's your kids or something, you know, who cares? So if we go back to us, you know, selling something like a naked put, right? You're collecting some of that premium, but you do have some risk. So by adding something like a vertical, you're just lowering the risk a little bit more, as I understand it, because you're kind of capping the losses as well as capping the profits. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, you're you're when you lower your basis, you're you're obviously um, in. You have to every time you you improve your position, you have to give something up. So if you're if you're improving your basis or lowering your cost basis, you're obviously going to have to give up some upside. But at the same time, you're taking your 50-50 bet and you're making it 60-40 your way. That's all it is. So like, you know, if you gave people the choice of, and you said, you know, here's, here's a bottle of water. You can buy it for a dollar. Hey, I am so excited about this sponsor that we have. The name of the company is Fold. They have a Visa debit card and here's the card right here. I use this thing literally every single day. Um, every time I swipe it, I get at least 1% back in, in rewards and the rewards are in Bitcoin. And um, some of the rewards go as high as 100%. There's even a full Bitcoin that you can win. After you swipe the card, you spin this little wheel on their app and then it produces the uh, reward. But the lowest uh, reward you'll get is a 1% uh, reward. The thing I really like about this card is um, you can also on their app buy uh, gift cards. And so Amazon is one of the partners that they have and you can go out and buy an Amazon gift card and you get 5% back when you use this card. And so like all your Christmas shopping or whatever it might be that you're doing on Amazon, you're getting 5% back. It's all paid to you in Bitcoin rewards. You can withdraw those Bitcoin rewards to a self custody wallet, whatever you want to do with it. There's no gimmicks. There's nothing that you're not seeing up front. Um, it's just an amazing uh, company, an amazing platform and every single swipe I'm getting Bitcoin. So I love it. Um, if you want to sign up for this thing, and I'm telling you, this thing is, this thing is a no brainer. Uh, go to foldapp.com slash TIP. That's foldapp.com slash TIP. You'll get 20% off uh, their spin plus annual fee uh, when you sign up uh, with that link. So go to foldapp.com slash TIP. And it's a 50-50 if it's going to go up or down, or here's a bottle of water and you can buy it for 80 cents. It's worth a dollar, but you can buy it for 80 cents, but you can, you can only go to a dollar 20. So most people would say, well, that's a 20% return. And um, and I have a, and obviously I, in this case, I have a, you know, an 80%, um, my, my probability of profit has improved by 20% over where it was before. So I have a 60%, it's 60, 40 is my probability of profit and I can make 20% on it. Well, I do that. And some people will go, Hell no! I think this water's going to three dollars, so I don't want to lock my. I don't want to cap myself at twenty at you know at at twenty percent. I think it's going to make two hundred percent or three hundred percent. I mean, those are the people that you know. Sometimes there's a few of those outliers that get really rich, and most of them don't make any money. But who knows? One of the things that intrigued me the most about options when I first learned about them was that it was sold to me kind of as this idea of like, hey. Now you can make money in the stock market, whether the stock market is going higher, whether it's going lower, or whether it's just staying stagnant. So if we take the idea like a vertical uh, of like selling and buying a put under a, a certain index or stock or whatever, and then also doing that above the price as well, you get something called an iron condor. And as I understand it, this strategy is best used when you kind of think something is going stagnant. Yeah. So. There's lots of strategies when you think like nothing's going to happen. You can sell an iron condor, you can sell a strangle, you know, there's lots of different, lots of different approaches to use. I mean, the beautiful thing about option strategies is there it's, it's the same general ingredients. You just make lots of different food with the same ingredients. Well, one of the other concepts that's been hard for me to wrap my head around is something like a calendar strategy and how to, or how or when to use something like that. So can you walk us through why, um, First of all, what that is and how you would do different strategies are appropriate for different um, implied volatility conditions. So, like for example, you would might use an iron condor if implied volatility was really high because you're hoping you're selling something that's rich and hoping it just sits right there. Um, like a calendar or any kind of a horizontal strategy, you're over multiple months, you're kind of hoping that volatility expands. So the back month premium that you're buying will go up. So it's it's, it really is just more of um, uh, you, you just kind of have to, you know, a little bit, just think through what, you know, how you want to play this volatility wise. And that's essentially, you know, those are the mechanics that we basically teach every day on Tasty. And we, we review them to death. Like we have mechanics for everything, um, every level of volatility, every level of implied, every level of implied volatility, every level of implied volatility rank, which is the ability to measure it against itself, every level of price, 
you know, I mean, every level of S&P volatility, I mean, it's all part of the concept of when you build a platform around, around fear. Like I think, I look at, one of the reasons I think we're successful is I don't view the online brokerage business the same way other CEOs do. I view the online brokerage business as it is our obligation to present you, the customer, with um, the ability to do whatever it is that you want to do. Like, like my job is to facilitate opportunity for you. And I don't care what that means. Like, so for one person, it means one thing for somebody else, something else, who cares? We're, we're here, you know, a really good online broker and a really good content provider um, builds, writes content, researches content and builds technology that basically allows the person that's using that content or using that technology to do whatever the hell they want to do. Because I believe those decisions should be made by the individual, not by some third party. The power is going back to the individual, you know, just like, you know, sometimes there's this, these huge movements in, in, in the world right now, there's, there's a lot of leverage going back to the labor force, uh, which has always been on the management side. It's now going back to the labor side, which is cool. There's also this big swing of passive investing, moving towards active investing. And I think it's really healthy. Part of it was the meme stock explosion and part of it's what you're continuing to see now with, with digital asset space exploding and other things like that. This is a very important, very powerful movement that will over time engage and empower individuals to manage their own money. And it's critical. And, and not paying somebody else to do things for you that you could learn how to do and at the same time improve your decision-making skills is critical. Well, you touched on having mechanicals for everything. And, and I've noticed that about Tasty Trade. You use it as this amazing platform for research and you, you share the results very often. And so I'm curious, what have been some of the most surprising discoveries for you and the research you've done, especially around maybe the timing of your, your option strategies? You know, the, in, in my mind, the, the single, there's two, I'm, I'm not gonna say single, there's two things that we've learned over the last 10 years that kind of blow me away because I missed them for the, for the other 30 years of my career. Um, one is the concept of trade small, trade often, basically law of large numbers and live and understanding that the, really the only way to define and measure and control your risk is an order entry. So if you stay small, you effectively do all your risk controls by staying small. So, and then by trading often, you put yourself in a position where you are essentially creating a portfolio based off law of large numbers, instead of a portfolio based on something subjective like technical or fundamental analysis or anything else. And so I really believe that trade small, trade often, critical, that's one. The second thing is, as far as mechanics go, managing positions at 21 days, as opposed to leaving them into the last 21 days, which is, which is kind of the negative part of the decay curve for us, and managing those positions earlier. So at 21 days, basically moving things out to the next month, like tomorrow is 21 days till, till November expiration. So we'll roll to December. And to me, that 21 day management has really been the key to improving, significantly improving what we do. On that last point, what is the target for getting into the position? How many days do you typically 45. start? 45. 45. Yeah, I mean, you can use any, but 45 is optimal. And you found that at 21, you get sort of diminishing returns or at least more risk potentially. 45 to 21, it's a beautiful world. Put them on at 45, take, you know, roll them forward at 21, move on to the next trade. We've always been, we never really understood that until we started to do, I mean, Tasty is essentially a think tank. So until we, until we started to do all that research, never really made any sense. Now we're kind of feel good about it. And on the trade small trade often piece, what I'm kind of curious about is what does that look like on a, the, a net return basis? You know, once you kind of factor in the taxes from those uh, profits and, and the trading I mean, commissions are negligible nowadays, yeah. I think, but you know, how do you factor that into the equation or, or how much of that is, you know, a concern or 
drives the decision making? Um, zero. I mean, you know, like I can't, I can't worry about, you know, I can't worry about taxes. I can't worry about that stuff. That I can't worry about stuff I can't control. You know, I mean, nobody, you don't take a job because of the taxes you have to pay. You don't, you know, the trading is the same thing. I mean, the numbers are relatively, you know, it, it depends. Um, most, most are short term, some are, you know, 1256B eligible, but which is max 28%. But I generally, you know, I, I don't worry about taxes. It's not my, you know, I, that's like saying, you know, I don't worry about taxes in anything I do. Like if I build a business, I'm not sitting here wondering, you know, oh my God, you know, what's my tax liability going to be? Um, it is what it is. You know, and I, you know, I move on. Am I right to remember that I think that there's some tax benefit of doing options on indexes or indices? Yeah, that's the 1256. That's the 1256. Yeah, that's what that gotcha. is. Max, max 60 40 split of long term, short term. That's all that is. Got it. Something that I think a lot of folks miss is that although you're selling something like a put and collecting that premium, you're actually locking up a large proportion of a capital. It's essentially in an escrow, right? To make sure that you can cover your bases should the trade go south. And in it, regular margin accounts, about 20%. 20%. So this tends to make these strategies, in my opinion, sometimes only relevant to people who have large pools of capital, since the premiums need to be large enough to not only allow a good yield, but the taxes and the things we just talked about. And I'm wondering if... Um, Mainly what I've seen from is this risk of these unrealized gains or losses affecting, uh, affecting newer investors, right? When they see the numbers swinging wildly sometimes and they have all that money locked up, uh, it can be pretty anxiety inducing for some. So how do you advise people to approach the risks of things like perceived or even just perceived uh, risks mean, of selling? Most people, most people are actually fairly comfortable with risk. Most people aren't seeing aren't used to seeing things mark to market. So like, you know, I mean, imagine if you sat around, imagine if you, um, if your house or your condo, whatever it is, and it was had a running ticker on it. And so like, you know, if the market was down 5%, you're like, oh my God, my half a million dollar house just lost $25,000, you know, and, and I can't believe it. Now, what am I going to do? Like you'd go crazy, but this is, you know, I will argue that what trading does is it it actually brings people into a completely different state of mind with respect to an acceptance of risk. They're just not used to things mark to market. I mean, imagine if we showed you a running ticker on your car, how much it depreciated every day. You know, like, like it's to me that, that argument makes no sense because this is the most efficient market in the world. And all we're doing is just disseminating prices. So, you know, if you, you have to learn some point. The problem that most people have is that they'll give their money to some money manager and or some passive investment. And at some point, they'll be up some money, which is great. At some point, they'll be down some money. And they really don't understand it or care because they don't really know how it works. And they don't have to watch it every single day. It, to me, that makes absolutely no sense because the learning from that, the learning process delivers zero. There's no takeaways. I mean, let's say you invest your money passively. And after 10 years, you made, I mean, let's just say you put your money passively away and the average passive return over time is like five, 7%, whatever it is. Let's say you make 10% a year over 10 years. So at the end of 10 years, you know, you look at your money, you go, wow, that's a pretty good return. But now where are you? You don't know Jack. You've learned absolutely nothing. You know where all you've got is twice the money that you had when you first started, but you haven't learned anything else. You don't actually know anything. And the other person that did, that did all their own investing, maybe they're, up, maybe they're up half as much, maybe they made nothing, maybe they made three times as much. I, I have no idea. But what I do know is they are far better prepared for everything else they're about to address in the rest of their life than the person that passively invested. So I'm going to argue that you know, in order to win, you have to experience things. And if you don't experience things, it's impossible to get to another level. And I really believe that, that most people don't ever get to that level because they don't get a chance to experience these things. Well, would you say that you're appealing to people who, well, let me put it this way. 
there's been a lot of talk of this rush into things like Robin Hood and a lot of these millennial and sure. Gen Z type crowd. I even read, I think earlier this week that half of option volume on Monday, I think was in Tesla. Like there's, there's a large amount of new money coming in in that way. But I think what's not often talked about is that what you just described, it takes a lot of time and attention to do, you know, hundred plus trades a day that there's people on the other side who are retiring, who, who don't have that day job anymore, who are learning things like options and maybe trying to implement that as a new hobby or new strategy to manage their own money. I'm curious Great. on the tasty trade demographics. Have you seen anything like that where there's a, there's a certain level of interest or is it all across the board? It's all across the board. It's not anything specific. I mean, I, we don't appeal directly to the Robin hood um, demographic, but we do have plenty of, you know, Robin hood type traders. Um, uh, we, we, we're pretty much across the board appeal to every, every demographic. Um, I'm all for everybody getting into trading. I, I don't even know what the, I don't like, if you ask me what the downside is, I mean, I couldn't even tell you. I mean, of course you can lose money. Who cares? You know, if you tell me I I've lost money on, I've lost money on 30 or 40 passive investments I've made privately over the last 30 years. I don't think I've ever cashed a single check and, and, it, and it's only helped me. It hasn't hurt me at all. It made me into a better entrepreneur. It made me realize that, oh my God, these people that I thought knew something, they didn't know anything. You know, what? I'm just saying, I, I don't, I don't look at any of my failures as, as things that have, you know, slowed me down or deterred me or changed my path or anything like that. And, and I don't even know if we would have been successful without all those failures and all those horrible investments. And all of them were passive, by the way, all the active investing I've done for 40 years has been great. All the passive investing I've done has been complete losers. And, and yet I, I value those losers. They, they made me smarter. Well, when you talked about, you know, a hundred trades in a day, which I keep going back to, cause I find it amazing. Are these trades that are on, you know, you mentioned the 45 days down to 21 is the magic number, but to do that level of volume, are we talking about, you're staying in trades for minutes or hours or, you know, in certain positions, or are these just that layered that you have, you know, they're 21 of, days. A lot of new trades, a lot of closing trades, opening, closing, adjusting. I do a lot of adjusting, you know, tweaking my position all day long. Um, a lot of bunch of scalps, um, some swing trades, you know, what's a scalp. I got to ask, what's a scalp, you know, in and out, like this morning, got first trade I made today was selling some Tesla stock and covering, you know, $10 lower and you know, that kind of stuff, you know, that's the stuff that turns me on. I like it. So you know? you're the guy who is 50% of the volume. Of <laughs> the Tesla no, no, no. I week. just traded small, <laughs> having some fun, just traded small. Um, it's great. You know, it's just like, just, having some fun, buying and selling some futures, you know, just playing. It's just a big playground for me. And I, I, I literally been playing in this playground now for 40 years. Like it's been every single day, the bell goes off in the morning. I love it. And uh, we play until the end of the day and that's it. Is that feasible for folks who have other day jobs though, that, you know, don't maybe not don't have the same sure. kind of time and attention during the market. Sure. I do it. I have a day job. I'm a CEO of a, of a billion dollar company. I mean, you know, I mean, I have a day job, of course. I gotta, I do a show for three and a half hours a day. I gotta run a company after that. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, of course. Can't argue with that. So yes. we, we study people like Warren Buffett on the show quite a bit and uh, we've okay. never really talked about his option strategies, but he has some. And the Probably. fact that he even has a track record of, of including some options into his strategies might even surprise some people, but have you learned anything or adopted any strategies based on how someone like Buffett has structured his trades? No, no. I, I mean, I think I like Warren Buffett because although I don't know anything about him um, other than like whatever I've read, you know, commercially or, you know, whatever kitschy little thing we've seen over the years, he seems like a very interesting, decent man. You know, that's that's how I would describe him. Um, I, I'm sure he uses some derivative strategies, mostly probably selling puts to get long. Um, I've heard of some of his trades, you know, through through the grapevine over the years, but um, I don't necessarily. I mean, I would argue that, you know, Warren Buffett is, you know, 
he's obviously an outlier of massive proportions, but at the same time, I would probably argue that in today's world, he's an average investor. You know, I mean, he's done nothing special in the last, you know, whatever, 20 some odd years. I mean, actually, I don't even want to say that he's, he is what he is, you know, like, like I, he's an outlier. He's a, he's an amazing outlier and what he's done in his career is incredible, but I wouldn't look at him today or Charlie Munger, any of those guys and say, wow, I want to do what they do. Like, it doesn't mean a damn thing to me. Interesting. When you were talking about staying small and trading off and what size are we really talking about? You know, I've heard some people on the long side go up to say 10% of their portfolio if they're going long on something. But if we're trading, are we talking like fractions of a percent on a, on a allocation it basis? Big, it depends how big your account is. But if your account size is like, you know, relatively, is it, if your account size is average, let's say 50,000 to 100,000 in that range, um, you know, it could be anywhere from one to 3%. Um, if your account size is, is um, larger, it could be anywhere from a fraction of a percent to, you know, one or 2%. Um, it really depends. But we, we almost never get bigger than, I mean, 5% would be, for me, would be a huge position. Like, I, I don't go there. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I kind of bring a Buffett, et cetera, is, is that one thing, when I was speaking to somebody very early on learning about options, they highlighted that, you know, if you look at something like the Forbes 100, right, and the billionaires in the list, you don't often see option traders up there in the highest ranks, right? So, because the, there's something about compounding capital and leaving it alone, it seems like. And even for yourself selling a billion dollar company, that's a large amount of value that came from you compounding this business for 10 years. I'm, I'm just curious, like, is there is there something just that uh, that is should be respected about the sport and the fun of it? versus like the wealth building aspect of it? Like, are there, or, or is this like your go-to, um, I think, strategy for wealth creation? Well, the richest person in Illinois is Ken Griffin, who is, you know, owns Citadel. Basically, they've made all their money selling options and trading Good options. Point. The richest person in Florida is Tom Pettifree, and he's made all his money owning interactive brokers and basically trading options. Um, the richest person in Philadelphia is the guy that owns Susquehanna. I mean, you're in, in Pennsylvania, I think is, is um, it, the guys from Susquehanna. I mean, I, I think you had to be really careful. Um, you know, there, that's only three States and those are the three richest people in those States. Um, I, you know, the, this is a relatively new industry. So this is not like old money, you know, like, but, but I would be, I, I think this is, you know, outside of crypto, because there's a lot of very interesting new crypto gazillionaires. But when you look at the financial service world, I would say that um, in the modern era, there are either all the wealth has been created from, on the option side, the future side, or the crypto side. I don't think it's the stock side. Interesting. And do you think that if derivatives start forming more and more on the crypto side or even the Web3 NFT side of things, would you be interested in that market, of et cetera? Of course. I think it's going to be massive. I think the I think the digital asset, I think the derivatives on the digital asset space is going to be huge. And I have no reason to think that we won't be you know, knee deep and head first into it. I think the derivatives on everything, derivatives are capital efficient. And underlyings without derivatives, cash markets are not capital efficient. And there's no, there's going to be no marketplace that survives long term without capital efficiency. So, no, I'm I'm very bullish on the derivative space and all the on all the markets that haven't been that haven't been exposed to derivatives yet. Very interesting. Um, one other question I had around the trading is what tools you like to use. I, if I remember, there's a large, a lot, you know, Bollinger bands, things like that come to mind as far as like trying to find, no, you're, you're shaking your no. head as far as <laughs> I'm not a technician. I don't use any charts or technical analysis. None of it. No real traders do. Um, I mean, that was always kind of the public way of thinking about, you know, well, we got to look at a chart and see what's going on, but there's no such, you know, fundamental. Um, I look at statistics, probabilities. I look at the math. 
I have zero interest in fundamentals, no news, no fundament, no company fundamentals, no, no interest in hearing what anybody else has to say and zero interest in technical analysis. Amazing. So if we're looking at price, are we talking about reversion to the mean stuff where you're looking at a, no, you know, nothing mean, like that? There's no such thing as reversion to the mean in price. It doesn't, there's no, there's no support for it in, in the math world, but there is support for reversion to the mean and implied volatility. So we do look for reversions to the mean implied volatility, but everything else we treat the markets as being, you know, um, I'm an efficient market theorist, treat the markets as being random. So that's it. With the implied volatility, you know, uh, I think about the VIX a lot and how it's kind of destined to keep going lower and lower based on the way it's structured. Does that mean that risk premiums and options will ever go lower and lower or they, is it all just relative? No, it's all relative. I mean, they're, they're, the VIX itself, I mean, some of the ETFs that always have, you know, that are, that are in contango that always go down, that's one thing different. That's market structure. But the VIX has a floor. You know, whatever that floor is, 9, 10, 11, 12, whatever it is. So, no, it'll never go lower. But you can't just buy it because the cost to carry is so high. What about earnings? You know, how do you typically look at earnings? Are you taking your own? Yeah. Like preemptively the shot. day before and then it's. Well, I base everything off expected move and implied volatility rank. So I'm looking for high implied volatility rank and then expected move like. Like I didn't trade Apple today because the implied volatility was too low for me um, and the expected move was too low. But generally, you know, um, I will trade expected move and implied volatility rank. That's it. That's all we do. Everything's based around expected move. Is expected move an, an, a proprietary calculation? No, I'm, of no that's, that exists on every platform? Everything. Well, we've built it into all our platforms. I don't know what other firms have done. Not Very my problem to watch those guys. <laughs> Very cool. Well, you know, what is next for Tom Sosnoff now that you sold your company for a billion dollars and, you know, what's, what's, uh, you were shaking things up, as you mentioned earlier, what's uh, getting you out of bed in the morning? Um, well, I'm still doing what I've always done. I'm running this company and, um, you know, we're trying to take it global. I've got some digital asset plans, some cool stuff we're building right now. I love the space. I mean, I'm a shareholder of the new company. So, um, so we're public in, in the UK. So that's cool. Um, so that's what I'm doing right now. But, you know, I'll be investing. Um, I'll be making investments. I'll be involved in different things. Um, but I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing right now. So, you know, like I love my job. You know, I don't even know if I get paid, <laughs> but I love my job. And, uh, um, and I love what I do. I love doing Tasty Trade. It's the greatest show on earth. And, and I love building technology and, and trading. So I'm pretty happy, um, you know, but, but I'll keep myself busy by, you know, challenging myself until, I mean, I'm never retiring. So I'm just going to keep doing stuff until, you know, until I can't do it anymore. One question I have to fit in here, and it is around the hundred trades you did today. How many, underlying assets are we talking about with 100 trades is it 100 different stocks is it no. five stocks how many i can tell you i'd be curious to know all right well you got to give me a second here we're going to count them up for you okay perfect this could take a few seconds i will looks like looks like 30 30 for today yes interesting 30 underlyings Right. And so is that the size of your normal watch list of sorts? Is it usually 30? Is that a, is that a comfortable range or is it 20 to 30, 20 to 40 a day? Yeah, sure. Interesting. And is it all the usual suspects? Yeah. Is it within a circle of competence? of Everything, yours at all? everything that's liquid is in play for me. Like today, I'll just give you an, in, I traded my first trade of the morning was in 10 year notes. That's futures options. Then I traded Bitcoin, Ethereum, Polkadot. Then I traded Garmin, Tesla, eBay, um, Shopify, Coin, Facebook, Affirm, more eBay, more Coin, Starbucks, Natural Gas, Futu, Snap. 
soybeans, crude oil, um, AMD, WeWork, <laughs> Tesla, Amazon. I mean, I'm just going through the list, but it's, you know, um, Wynn, Apple, NASDAQ, Russell. I mean, that's just a name of a couple. But yeah, I mean, I'm all over the place. I'm indifferent to product. I don't give a crap. I'll trade right, agnostic. If it's, li- if it's liquid, I don't care what it is. It means the name means nothing to me. Can It's more about where that implied volatility and expected return. With, do, you, do you filter for those numbers? Is, these things uh, I do, I do. And it's also about liquidity. Every single thing I trade is liquid. I don't Meaning trade that, it's not liquid. The bid ask spread is very tight. Bid ask spreads relatively tight. You know, most are liquid products. Um, mix it up. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Tom, this has been a real honor to have you on our show. I've been a longtime fan of yours. I'm very impressed with what you've built uh, many times over. It's it's really interesting, and I can tell how much you love this stuff. And it's exciting. It's crazy, you know, Trey. When it when it all boils down to it, it's just like you just look around. And you're like, okay. This is cool. Like I would do this every afternoon and talk to people about it. Cause it's just, if it inspires someone like you or gets somebody else going, you know, and it lights a fuse or gets you excited about the business. It's cool. Cause you guys are the guys that have to, you know, you're the next generation. You have to carry the torch, you know, take it forward. Very cool. Well, Tom, before I let you go, I definitely want to make sure I give you an opportunity to hand off to our audience where they can learn more about you, tasty trade, any other endeavors that you're working on? Um, well, you, I'm on air every morning on Tasty Trade. It's the largest digital financial network now in the world. So tastytrade.com and we're free. Everything's free. The content's free. The archives are free, everything. Um, so you can check out tastytrade.com. I'm on from 7 a.m. Central Time to 10 a.m. Central Time. And then from 2.30 to 3 in the afternoon. Um, and that's my daily stuff. And then then you, if you want to see our software, which I think is the best in the world and and all the technology we've built, it's on Tastyworks and it's a, it's a downloadable. So you can just go to Tastyworks, you can download it. And if you like our stuff, you know, you can open an account with us. Our rates are great. Our content's amazing. And our technology blows away everybody else. So, and we offer, we're the only firm that offers everything. Stock options, futures, futures options, crypto. We have everything. Very cool. Well, thank you again very much, Tom. I really appreciate it and uh, look to look forward to have you on the show again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Trey. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.